Hi, and welcome to episode number 58 of the weekly Google Cloud Platform podcast. I am Francis Campoy, and I'm here with my colleague, Mark Mendel. Hey, Mark, how are you doing? I'm very sleepy. You got me up very early this morning because you're in Europe. I know. I'm, I'm in this beautiful place called Torrellas de Bragat near Barcelona, <laughs> working from <laughs> home. Uh, and yeah, it's, uh, it's like 4.20 p.m. here. So it was like 7 a.m. in San Francisco. Yeah, it's like, yeah, you got me up. You got me up super early. So. Yeah. Thanks for that. I love you. Thank you so much. I'm not even sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm actually, I'm actually not even sorry about that. I'm, I'm sorry about the topic of the podcast today. You're not sorry. <laughs> I mean, so nah. today's topic uh, is where Frances spontaneously combusts because we're talking about Java. Yay! Uh, but we have a wonderful conversation about Java and Java on GCP with Ray Sang and Rajiv Dayal. Yep. You may, you may recognize Ray from previous episodes as well. Yep, such as many others, actually. Uh, I think that he did one with... Uh, the one I can remember is the one about Google Cloudspin. Yeah, Google Cloudspin. That was fun. But I think he's all, also been to another one. I do not remember now. That's all right. And then at the end, we're going to have a discussion about moving data between cloud providers, specifically if you need to move data from S3 to cloud storage. Is there an easy way to do that? But before we do that, why don't we get stuck into our cool things of the week? Uh, Francesca, I know you found a bunch of really interesting ones. Yeah, there's one. Of, there's actually two of them that I'm very excited about because uh, there are things that I'm actually going to do. Uh, the first one is a TensorFlow course. Uh, it's a crash course on deep learning with TensorFlow. And it's three hours long. And it doesn't require a PhD, that's what they say. So I'm pretty excited because I do not have one. So <laughs> I, I do not have a PhD either. Yeah, so I'm very excited about uh, going through it, learning a little bit more about all the details of TensorFlow and how to actually use it uh, for something specific, like try to build something with it. I've been thinking about it for a while, and I think that, that that's a perfect opportunity to try it. Yeah, it looks like it's a video course, is that right? Yeah, it's actually a video course. It's, uh, as I said... A bunch of hours, <laughs> but it's definitely worth it. And it's done by uh, Martin Garner, uh, one of our teammates, a uh, developer advocate for Google Cloud Platform in Paris. Very, very cool. So speaking of teammates, uh, one of our other developer advocate teammates, uh, Amy, or Amy Gidala, as she's on Twitter, has written a blog post about combining uh, CloudML natural language API and running a Slack bot and how they can be integrated together. Yeah, it is. It is really cool because there's two things. I mean, there's there's bots, and everybody likes bots, of course. But also, course. Uh, there is all the parts about CloudML. The natural language API is super powerful. Uh, I don't know if you have played a little bit with it. A little bit, a little bit. Yeah, uh, one of my favorite things is that you can. It, it does uh, entity recognition, which is basically you can say things like uh, New York, and it's just like yeah, New York. But you can also say the Big Apple, and it will say yeah, New York. So it's actually able to understand all of these complex uh, concepts and tie them together, which is very nice. Yeah, what I thought was quite interesting about this too is so it does sentiment analysis in terms of like, are these positive comments or negative comments? And it can respond. But you can also uh, do like topped entity listing. So you can start to see what the topics of conversation across time have been within the Slack channel, which I think is actually really, really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I will not get into the details on the Slack channel where she's talking because it seems like it's related to politics, which I try to avoid lately. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I think we have one more cool thing of the week, though. Yeah, so we talked about this a little bit uh, last week where we were talking about cloud audit logging so that you can determine like who does what and where and when and how on the Google Cloud Platform. Um, but literally last week when we announced the blog at the same time, uh, sorry, we announced the podcast, uh, at the same time there was a blog put out explaining that we have significantly expanded the set of products that cloud audit logging is now integrated with, which is really cool. So it now works with Compute Engine, Container Engine, Data Proc, Deployment Manager, Cloud DNS, Key Management Service, Cloud Storage, and Cloud SQL. Uh, the above integrations are all in beta, but it does work across the board. So it's pretty sweet. And the article goes through how you can interact with the audit logs in Cloud Console, how you can interact with them in uh, Stackdriver, uh, you can do um, alerts, um, and it even talks about if you're signed up for the Alpha for Cloud Functions, how you can also use Cloud Functions to interact with uh, your audit trails as well. So you can have automatic responses to certain actions that people take within your Google Cloud Platform project, which I think is pretty cool as well. Nice. 
So yeah, I think that is important to remember to remind uh, our to our listeners, just in case you're wondering, like what is the difference between cloud audit logging and uh, Google Cloud IAM? Because sometimes it might be a little bit confusing. The way I like to put it is, uh, Cloud IAM says who is allowed to say to do what, and Cloud Audit Logging uh, says uh, wh- who did what. So it's not if you're allowed That's- or not. It's like did you actually do it? So it's good for logging. Like if you have something that people sh- are allowed to do, but you want to make sure that they don't do it too often, or they they have a reason behind it to do it. That is the product to use. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. All right. Well, I think that's probably enough for cool things of the week. I'm sure we could go on for a while. But uh, why don't we go have a chat with Ray and Rajiv and talk about Java? I don't want to. No, it's okay. <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> it sounds good. Today, we are joined by a teammate and also by an engineering manager. Uh, we are joined today by Ray Tsang and uh, Rajiv Dayal. Uh, Ray, how are you doing today? Pretty good. How are you? Good. And Rajiv, how are you doing? I'm well. I'm well. Thank you for asking. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, before we get stuck into all the good things, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, Rajiv, why don't you go first? Um, So I'm Rajiv and I'm an engineering manager here at Google. I've been at Google for about 10 years or so, so quite a while. Um, And I'm right now managing teams that work on the cloud SDK and Java on Google's cloud platform. So I'm really focused on cloud developer tools. Uh, before that, I used to work on the Google Web Toolkit, um, or, or GWT, as it's now called. Um, so, uh, yeah, some of you may remember that. I remember that. I used to use that a <laughs> long time ago, yeah. <laughs> that is cool. Uh, what about you, Ray? Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what do you do? Sure. So I'm a developer advocate. I'm based in New York, and uh, I focus a lot on the Java communities and Java developers and making sure that the experiences with Google Cloud Platform is the best uh, for the community as well. And if I'm not mistaken, it's your second episode with us? That's right. Yes. This is my second episode. Thanks for having me back. Uh, given that the last last episode, I don't know how well we did. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> oh, thank no, you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it was the uh, it was the cloud spin episode, which I had a lot of fun with. So I'm happy to be back again. Awesome. We're very happy that you're back. Excellent. All right. So we are having an episode about Java. We have talked about some other languages, so we figured it's good to come around to Java as well. Um, so I guess I'll ask Rajiv, you know, like, why Java? Why is Java important to GCP? What's the what's the story there? Well, um, uh, Java, you know, it's an important language. It's been, it's been, I guess, it was released in like mid-90s. And then since then, it's just become... Uh, you know, pretty much a staple language that's used uh, that's used everywhere. Honestly, it's used very heavily in enterprise. I think the language index, the Tyobi index, still shows Java as the most used, uh, most heavily used language um, across the board for all sorts of applications. So, um, yeah, it's just a you know, it's a it's a hugely important language, and it's also um, you know, I think one of the reasons for that is because it's just pretty versatile as well. Uh, like it's it's one of those languages. Some some people say like, oh, you know, which is more expressive or it's too verbose, uh, and some of those things may be true. But it's also shown that you can build like really large applications and services with it. Uh, like you can have like really big code bases and they're still maintainable. So yeah, it's a so it's really important that you know we support Java developers and such workloads on GCP, especially as more enterprises are moving into the cloud. Cool. So I know that one of the like one of the places where we talk about Java all the time uh, on the cloud is App Engine. But yes. uh, what 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 other things are there uh, in Google Cloud Platform that are related to Java, and the, what is the best places to run Java on Google Cloud Platform? Um, that's a so I'll take I'll take a stab at this, and then Ray can jump in. Um, mm. I th- I think it really depends on what you're doing, right? So uh, App Engine. App Engine Standard actually is is like a good place to run Java if you really care about like very like sort of spiky traffic, very fast sort of like scale up and scale down. Uh, you want to have reactiveness to that, and you're okay with sort of 
being a little more constrained in what you do because you want the auto scaling to work for you. So that's a very good environment for uh, Java, actually, because um, you don't have to think about the scaling. Um, if you're working with containers, you know, Kubernetes and then running it on GKE is obviously a great environment for that. This is basically hosted Kubernetes. So there you kind of have more control. You're working with containers and, you know, Kubernetes, like, yeah, you can handle, especially if you're sort of breaking your application up into microservices, uh, you can handle like pretty heavy, uh, pretty heavy traffic and whatnot. You can kind of do what you want there. And then, of course, you've got uh, Google Compute Engine or GCE, and that's just a raw VM. So obviously, you can do what you want. It's just that all the setup is up to you. So there's lots of different places to run Java workloads on uh, Google's cloud platform. It really depends on what you want to do. And I believe you can also run like Java on some of our big data stuff as well, like Dataflow and some other tools. Yeah, that's correct. Actually, that's correct. Actually, the data flow, the data flow SDK is actually a is is actually Java. It's actually Java, and uh, so yeah, that, that's also really popular. Excellent, uh, Ray. I know there's some other places where Java is supported, not just to be able to just run your code, but other things like that. Uh, so like tooling and, and SDKs and IDEs and stuff. Ray, you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So um, so actually, uh, Rajiv and um, and another engineer uh, team lead here. Uh, who's not here today on the podcast, but uh, Patrick, uh, they actually develop all the toolings uh, for Java. Uh, so we have really good tooling support for, um, you know, if you're into the, the building tools. So for Maven and Gradle, we have plugins for those. Uh, for the IDEs, we also have uh, IDEs uh, integrations with Eclipse IntelliJ. So the idea there is to for you to be able to, you know, start a project uh, and, uh, you know, deploy, uh, develop your applications and uh, being able to deploy into some of those environments that uh, Rajiv just mentioned uh, seamlessly directly from the IDE. Uh, but also if you need to integrate with say a CICD platform of some sort or manage your own deployment, you can also do that from the command line, uh, from your plugins as well, from the, uh, the build tools. And yeah, just to, uh, just adding on to that a little bit, uh, so we've had in the past, you know, plugins for Eclipse, like the Google plugin for Eclipse, which has been there for a long time and is being used to support, uh, you know, GWT and actually App Engine for a long time. And we're actually building new, we've invested back in that and we're building new Eclipse tooling that is just purely cloud focused, actually. So um, we're putting a lot more investment into Eclipse. And we'll want we'll expand that functionality as well to handle things like data flow to make it a lot easier to work with data flow. There already is a plugin for Eclipse for data flow. We'll integrate those two together so it'll be in one package. So I've also been seeing a lot of activity on the IntelliJ plugin as well. Can you talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah, yeah. Actually, so that whole thing started with um, let's see. So with the so with Android Studio. So Android Studio was released in uh, I think it was like 2013, um, and uh, it is built on the IntelliJ platform, as as I think most people know now. And actually, we did cloud integration in there uh, like a while back, actually. And the idea back then was. Oh, like create an app engine backend and use cloud endpoints to wire that up to your mobile application with the thought being that, okay, you just want a simple backend and a way to talk to it with REST. Um, now we have other solutions like Firebase, which are better suited to that. But that's kind of what we started with. And then what we did was we basically spun that back out and improved it into just like a uh, IntelliJ plugin for um, Community Edition and Ultimate to be able to just like, if you're just a, a cloud developer, to be able to work with App Engine. Um, and that's kind of be our basis. We're going to expand upon that and build more GCB features into that plugin. And, you know, it's timely because IntelliJ's popularity has really uh, taken off like in the past um, two or three years. So, like, we really need to have a good story in both IDEs because the community is split across both of them. Yeah, I, I use IntelliJ a lot. I don't actually write in Java in it. I use it for everything else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm a huge fan. Too, right? it's, it's, there. it's pretty good for uh, for almost every language it, it, it supports. They're, they're very good, yeah. Cool. So since we're talking about other languages, uh, what about the other languages that run on the JVM? We've been talking mainly about Java, but what if I have a Scala application? Can I run Scala on... I mean, of course, I can run it on Google Compute Engine, but can I run it also on App Engine? Yeah, I can take a stab at it. Um, so, for example, uh, with uh, App Engine Flex, you can basically run whatever you want. So it's not limited to you know pure Java or any uh, certain languages that you know that it supports. But uh, if you really want to, you can definitely just uh, write it in whatever languages you wish to write in, uh, including any of the the other JVM languages, and uh, just being able to you know package it up properly, uh, or even just package it up into a Docker container. 
And as long as you are listening to the right ports and responding to the right health check points, endpoints, uh, we will be able to serve those uh, applications directly in App Engine Flexible as a pass. Now, of course, you can always, if you have the container, you can also always just run it in a, a Google Container Engine if you need uh, fine control over your application. So you could do it either way. Cool. What, what about on standard? Is it a bit hacky? I have to ask. I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, I, if I want to take my Closure app and run it on App Engine standard, can I do that? Now it depends. So does Closure app um, can, can, can you actually package it into a WAR file? Because you need to be able to deploy that into a Tomcat or sorry a Jetty container at the moment. Uh, so for example, you cannot at the moment run any of the jar files if you have a self executable jar. But uh, if you can package up your app in a standard uh, Jetty container. Uh, in a WAR file, then you may be able to run it. Um, you should give it a try, Mark. <laughs> yeah, there, I'll, I take, it, I'll you, take it for a spin. If you do enough hackery, there's probably some way to get it going, right? <laughs> yeah, I bet you there is some way to get it going. Yeah. And uh, could you share if there's any any actual plans on uh, doing more about these languages? Like, for instance. Uh, we recently had someone new in our team that uh, Guillaume Laforge, uh, crea he created um, uh, Groovy. What about Groovy? On oh, Appentian Standard, I'm talking about. That's a, so I, that's a good question, actually. Um, I think there, so, I mean, there isn't anything directly in the pipeline that I know about to, to, support, to support that, but I do know they're working to... This sounds kind of weird to make the app engine standard environment slightly more flexible, uh, you know, so that so so that you could basically have less. You're still running Java. It's still you're kind of in a JVM, but there's fewer restrictions. So in a world like that, I could see more of that being possible. But I couldn't concretely say yet, honestly. Cool. It's fair. So uh, I have a question. As uh, some of you may know, uh, I don't write Java that often. I'm more of a Go person. Uh, I know it's shocking. Uh, so that's okay. one of the, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> one of the things that I've heard about is that you know, like when you create microservices in Java, it's not really a microservice because the JVM is so big. <laughs> is that actually a problem? Like if. <laughs> I'm sincerely asking the questions. Like, for instance, if you have on on GKE, uh, is a container going to take longer to start because of the JVM being large, or is there any of those issues that people that are running Java should? Take uh, so, like, um, you know, as far as microservices is concerned, right? The actual code that you write in Java, uh, given the recent framework developments like Spring Boot and many many others, uh, you actually write very few code to achieve a lot. Because of all the common, you know, tasks that these frameworks will be able to take care of you, uh, for you, and so the the code that you write is actually uh, quite small. Uh, you can really focus on the business that you need to, the business problem that you need to solve. Uh, in the end, the the end package, the actual, you know, um, binary file that you compile is also very small. So the JVM is really there for you, you know, to support the runtime environment. Now with Docker containers, of course, there's the concept of layering. So you can layer the JVM image underneath of your app so that you don't have to, say, redeploy hundreds of megabytes of JVM every single time. Uh, so the actual app that you deploy could be as small as the code that you actually just changed. And that is a powerful concept because uh, you know, that will then give you a very rapid deployment across you know, all, of the, uh, all of the service that you have. So you don't have to really uh, manage um, you know, which version of JVN should you be running uh, because all of that will be encapsulated in one of the image layers that you depend on. And the startup time is actually quite fast. Uh, cool. I mean, these apps can start in seconds, uh, to be honest. Uh, so that shouldn't be much of an issue. Nice. Cool. Uh, nice segue, I think. Uh, you mentioned Spring there. I know we've also talked about Jetty and a couple of things. Like, if I'm a Java developer and I'm going back to a while when I used to live a lot in the JVM, um, are there particular frameworks or, or as you were talking about Jetty, things like uh, basically runtime environments, I guess, uh, that are better supported than others? Like, so if I'm coming to GCP and I want to write a Java app, should I be looking at particular frameworks or particular runtimes to, to get my app running uh, so I can run it on the web, if that makes sense? So at the very basic of it is, you know, the GE standards with the servlet. So that's definitely supported, right? So even today, uh, I mean, since App Engine standard, uh, GE spec has been uh, supported in a way. So you can write a servlet, you can serve your JSPs, uh, very standard Java stuff. Uh, in Flex, right, you can 
it run even more, uh, basically removing some of the traditional App Engine standard uh, sandbox restrictions. You can run basically whatever uh, whatever framework framework that you want to run. But uh, Rajiv, you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I, so I think, I think you covered it well. I guess what I would add is, um, there is a bunch of work that, that we, uh, that is in progress. So, so it isn't there yet because the, to integrate more of these frameworks with, in with GCP. So for example, um, in spring, there's things like spring cloud stream, and we want to integrate that in with, uh, our, our cloud pub sub. Right, so that you have a nice integration there. You could wire it up yourself if you wanted to, but that's obviously a bunch of work, and we want to have something like that ready for you uh, when you come to the platform. Another example is um, so we have the Stack Driver Diagnostics platform uh, that's part of uh, that's part of GCP. So you know this gives you information on your application as it runs. You know you have like you have stats, you see like traces and whatnot, um, and and you see like you know, logging, error reporting. We want to wire that into what Spring also has in that vein, like Spring Actuator and whatnot as well. So that like, basically you can get that uh, for free as opposed to having to wire all of that up yourself. So um, these are these are integrations that we're currently working on right now. They don't exist yet, but we want to make it a much better experience when you come to our platform with Spring and you just get a lot more for free. Cool. Um, since we're talking about stuff that's coming, is there anything else you want to talk about that might be in the pipeline that... Java developers might be excited about? Uh, so one thing that I want to mention is uh, something that actually just came out, uh, I think, before the New Year's. Uh, it is our uh, Zipkin connector. So if anyone who is interested in developing uh, microservices in general, uh, a lot of it, you, know, you might need to be able to trace the calls across multiple services. And like in the Java world, a lot of it is using Zipkin. And you can tie it up with Spring Boot if you want to. Uh, so rather than maintaining, say, your own Zipkin server, uh, there's actually a proxy now that can take in Zipkin uh, requests. Uh, that's you know for the tracing, and then you can forward uh, the trace uh, information directly into Cloud uh, uh, Stack Driver Trace. So what that means is you have less to maintain, and uh, you don't have to change your code in order to uh, be able to trace your applications. You can browse all the trace uh, information directly from the GCP console. Another another cool thing. It isn't. It isn't super new, but I don't know how well known it is, is the cloud debugger, actually. So this is a pretty cool piece of technology. Um, it's actually a, uh, what what you might call like a post-mortem debugger, or, or it's a production debugger. So, you know, it, you when you set a breakpoint, uh, you're not actually stopping execution. What you're actually doing is you're saying that, okay, you want to take a sample or trace of like some of the requests and the uh, sort of a snapshot of the stack at that point in time so that you can come back later and you can sort of view like, okay, you know, when I hit this, when I hit this breakpoint, what was going on at this time? And this is pretty cool because normally you can't use this type of feature in production because you would halt execution and then no one can go to your site and that's no good, right? But what we've done here is now like, you know, you can even set conditional breakpoints. So, like, on a certain condition, you trip this. And then you can be like, oh, what happened here? Like, this was hit. Like, why was it hit? Let me walk through. And we've actually wired integration into IntelliJ. So you can actually walk through the stack and look at the stuff as you would just in a normal debugger. So you're not actually breaking execution, but at least you have a familiar interface into that. And they recently added a new feature. Uh, I think it's in the web UI. We haven't entered the IDE yet, which is called like dynamic log points. So, you know, how many times you had like where you're, you know, you're, you want to know more information because something's going wrong in production and you're like, Oh geez, I wish I had added that log statement. And then you go, you add the log statement, you rebuild, you, whatever you redeploy hours go by. And then you see the log and you're like, Oh wow, I wish I had even more log in for, and you do that again. Right. With dynamic logs, you actually can set, uh, at a point in the code that's in production on a source line and say, like, I want to print this this information, these variables, and actually, it actually sets that dynamically, like, in the bytecode. So without having to redeploy or anything, you actually can set a logging statement in there, and then you'll start seeing the logging statements as they're hit. So that's, like, a really powerful uh, feature to sort of, like, figure out what's going on in production without, like, and saving you probably, like, hours or, I don't know, days of, like, redeploying with, like, more logs and more logs and more logs. So that's a really cool feature. Yeah, as I go for that makes me super jealous. <laughs> that's super cool. <laughs> one, day, one day, one day, one day you guys will get there. <laughs> so I feel like we should definitely, uh, you know, take a, a stab or, or take a look at the elephant in the room. Uh, Java <laughs> eight, uh, I believe that's what what states that in. How's that going? 
<laughs> Java 8. That's, that's a good question. That, that's a very good question. So, um, so Java 8 uh, actually works quite well on App good. Engine Flex. If you're the App Engine Flex environment, we have supported runtimes for Java 8 or OpenJDK, like 8 and plus Jetty 9 or just OpenJDK 8. And obviously you're like, what are you doing on standard? Why isn't it there? And, and you're right. Well, that's actually in the pipeline. Like we can't promise an exact date yet, but it's actually being worked on. And, you know, like it's looking very promising. So this is something that's top of mind for us. Cool. Uh, so I just wanted to add one one funny thing. When you said the elephant in the room, <laughs> I thought about Hadoop. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, different different elephant. Yeah, it's a lot of elephants. Elephant. Yeah. So uh, I guess we're kind of running out of time. But is there any other topic that you'd like to discuss or something that we might have missed, uh, Ray? Uh, no, I think I'm okay here. But uh, oh, one one thing, Francesc, when are you going to try Java again? Just wondering. Uh, when it when it has support for Go routines, <laughs> you can call them Java routines if you want to. You can you can have Go routines in alternative JVM languages. In alternative, like yeah. Yeah. actually, actually, I'm thinking about learning Closure. So, That's okay. nice. Yeah, it's like Java, just better. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. I I I'm not a troll. Just <laughs> Yeah, we're we're basically going to keep investing in Java as much as we can until you switch over to Java. So you know, we're we're full steam ahead. Going to get you off of Go. You know what? And that's an incentive for you never to touch Java. So <laughs> right. it always gets yeah, better. We're be working hard over here. Yeah, I, I'm an important part of the Java community by not being part of it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, what about you, Rajiv? Is there any topic that you'd like to? Uh, no, I think we um I think we covered everything pretty well. Uh, this was great. Uh, I guess all I would add to it is that yeah, like. We're really serious about Java, and we're putting a lot of resources and investment behind it because there's just so much we can do to make it better for um, for Java developers on GCP. There's just tons we can do, so we're putting a lot of attention there. Excellent. And I know uh, either one or both of you, are you going to be at particular events coming up as well? Yeah, so uh, I do try to um, you know go to uh, plenty of uh, Java-related events and uh, Java user groups, so... Um, I'm gonna be traveling quite a bit around. Um, you know, one of the first stops is gonna be JFocus in Sweden uh, in February. So I'm looking forward to that. And you know, if you do see me on the road or if you wanna chat, uh, I would love to, you know, learn about you know your experiences and how you want to use the platform and uh, you know provide any of the feedback to us. Uh, love to get it also back to the engineering teams as well uh, to make our experience better and uh, so that developers will love to use. And right after that, I think we're going to meet at Fostum. Yeah, I will see you at Fostum. Uh, no, actually, Fostum comes before that. So I'm going to be in Fostum for the weekend and then oh. go straight to Sweden right after that. Yep. And uh, there's also the, the DevOps US that's going to be their first DevOps in the United States. Uh, so I'm going to be there with uh, many, many other uh, people as well, including Guillaume LaForge and uh, many of the engineers uh, were going to be there. So looking forward to meeting everyone in DevOps US too. Yeah. Very cool. Excellent. Well, to both of you, thank you so much for joining us. It has been a pleasure and a delight talking to both of you. Thank you. Likewise. This was great. Thanks so much. So thanks again to Ray and Rajiv for taking the time and making me discover that actually Java is a very interesting language with a vibrant community. Yeah, no, it was a really good interview. Um, obviously, Java is very much alive and well. Now, yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I used to use the JVM a lot, so it's it's a warm spot in my heart for it, and so it's great to see all the stuff that's going on there. Nah, I like to joke about it, but I know it is a very interesting language because you know, like, there's basically half of the internet that is built on it, so it's good to have it and and have a good place to run it, like Google Cloud Platform. Anyway, I think it's time to go with our question of the week. Uh, so we had a really interesting question this week. I think in terms of, say, uh, you have a whole bunch of data on Amazon S3, for example, uh, and you want to de transfer data to Google Cloud Storage. Is there an easy way of doing that? Very interesting question, but I actually have a pre-question a pre for that, which is, uh, do you know what S3 stands for? I do not know what S3 stands for. What does S3 stand for? I'm almost sure it's Simple Storage Service, but I'm not completely uh... sure, but I think so, which, which, you know, it's kind of a cool name. But yeah, everybody calls it S3, and then it's like, what? Anyway, so yeah, uh, how do you transform it from AWS S3? How do you move that data to, to Google Cloud Storage? I actually do not know. So it is interesting. So the GSL, so we do have a GSUtil command line tool uh, for working with Cloud Storage. 
Um, you can use the GSUtil GSUtil utility. That sounds redundant. <laughs> the GSUtil tool to work with Amazon S3 buckets as well. However, uh, the probably the most efficient way of doing things is we do have this thing called a cloud storage transfer service, uh, which is specifically set up for transferring data from one cloud storage provider to another, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, obviously, you're going to have network. Um, network costs are moving from one to the other, so that, keep that in mind. Uh, but you're able to set it up so that you have like basically uh, sources and sinks. So like, where do you want it to go from? Where do you want it to go to? Um, and then you can kind of set it up to happen like periodically or maybe just once off. There's a programmatic interface. There's um, the, You can go through the console UI, you know, and there's a series of REST APIs as well. So you can really kind of pick and choose how you want it to to work, but it is a nice and easy way of just transferring that data across if you need to do that between different cloud providers. Cool. That sounds that sounds indeed very useful. Uh, I don't know how often that kind of things are needed to be done, but if you're thinking about starting to try a Google Cloud Platform and you know it's like you need to pass all your data around, it's probably the best way to do it. Yeah, and I think you know it's it's kind of cool. It's one of those things that you really need it when you need it, but if you don't need it, then you don't. Like it's one or it's one or other. Yeah, um, but if you if you don't know it exists, then it's uh, it could be really painful to pull everything down, say locally, like via GSUtil, and then push it back up again into the cloud. Whereas you'd much rather run it over the big fat pipes that usually run between all that big data yeah. centers. And if you need to do syncing in between uh, AWS and GCP, I think that there's a thing that I should mention because you know it's a tool brain in Go and it's open source. It's called Minio. And and they're really cool because you know they're they're really go so of course they're good is a cool tool but uh, check it out it actually supports a bunch of different services uh, storage services from different clouds so there's Interesting. S3 but also there's Google Cloud Storage they have their own Minio server it also supports OpenStack Swift so it's definitely worth having a look if what you need is a little bit more complex than just passing from one side to the other ones excellent. Well, Francesc, before we run off today, I think we should remind people how to get in contact with us uh, so they can send us emails and cool things of the week and questions of the week and all sorts of other good stuff. Yes, because we haven't done that yet in 2017. So uh, you say the things, I say the places. Okay, or so <laughs> uh, we'll start with, okay, if they want to go to our domain name, where can they go? Uh, that is gcppodcast.com or cloud.google.com slash podcast. Uh, if they want to email us, where should they do that? Uh, they should send an email to hello at gcppodcast.com. If they want to find us on Reddit, it is r slash gcppodcast. Uh, if they want to find us on Google Plus, plus gcppodcast. And if they want to find us on Twitter, at gcppodcast. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not a, least, there's a theme there's going a, on. <laughs> there's a theme, definitely a theme. And uh, finally, if they want to find us on Slack, where can they find us? Uh, that is the hard one. Uh, on Slack, there's a podcast channel inside of the Google Cloud Platform community uh, that you can join by going yes. somewhere. Bit.ly slash GCP dash Slack. Cool. We'll have all of those just in case people are wondering. Uh, they're all in the webpage anyway. So just go check it out at gcpodcast.com. Okay, so before we go, I guess it's time to uh, ask, what are you going to be next week? Actually, uh, where are you now? You're in San Francisco. I'm in Barcelona. What are your plans yep. afterwards? Uh, so I'll be at GDC, the Game Developer Conference here in San Francisco. We're sponsoring a bunch of events going on. So we are sponsoring Women in Games. If anyone's going to be at that party, we'll be there. Uh, we're sponsoring Blackington Games as well. Uh, so if anyone's going to be there, come and say hello. Uh, we'll be around. I think if you're looking for us, we'll definitely be hanging out by the Improbable Booth because they're a partner of ours. Uh, and they, we have a developer day. There's a Google developer day on Tuesday and a sponsored session. Uh, I'll be there talking about basically running dedicated game servers in the cloud, uh, mainly on Kubernetes, actually, both in my nice. lightning talk and in our sponsored session on Wednesday morning as well. Uh, and then they'll be next. Yes, cloud next. That's going to be fun. Uh, that sounds like a lot of things going on for you uh but sounds fun yeah, lots of parties it, it's all around gdc yeah very GDC cool it's gonna be crazy and i know you're up to a bunch of stuff while you're wandering around europe yes i'm actually kind of doing a european tour because you know i like to i like the cold weather uh i'm currently in barcelona because i will be speaking at the go meetup on thursday uh so yep. tomorrow 
And then the week after that, I will be in Paris where I'm trying to organize also a meetup, but uh, it's not completely sure. But uh, that weekend will be in Fosdem in Brussels. And we have a go dev room. So you get, if you're around, come say hi. Uh, we, I think we still have time. We still have place for a uh, lightning talk. So if there's anyone around there visiting, uh, they want to give a lightning talk about Go, let me know. And after that, uh, yeah, I'll be coming back for Go SF. Uh, we're going to celebrate that Go 1.8 is coming out. And the week after that, go for Con India. So yeah, traveling a little bit around the world. <laughs> and that is before Cloud Next. So it's kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, you're presenting at Cloud Next as well? Yes, I'm presenting at Cloud Next. I'm going to be talking about uh, Google Cloud Endpoints. Very cool. I'll be on stage as well talking with our gaming partner and probable about massively large persistent online worlds. That sounds that sounds very interesting. That sounds kind of like uh, a little bit like Pokemon Go massively online worlds. Yeah, uh, this is more in the MMO kind of realm. Very large online simulations. That sounds pretty cool. It's very interesting stuff, actually. It is pretty cool. Awesome. Well, Francesc, thanks so much for joining me yet again this week. Thank you so much, Mark, for waking up so early. And thank you all for listening. Yeah, and talk to you all next week. <laughs>